Baruch Hashem, my name is Mark Wichtenwalter, and uh, I'm going to be continuing on uh, YouTube where my podcast, The Kingdom of God or Nothing, ended. Um, I used to be able to do free shows, but apparently um, Blog Talk Radio decided they didn't, they don't want to do any more like free shows. And uh, I don't have time or money to do uh, two-hour, three-hour shows every day like I used to. Uh, I just don't have the money to to be doing that at this time. And uh, it's a shame because they put ads on all of my podcasts. And it's like, you know, hey, uh, you guys are making money off of my content and... Like, with the Kingdom of God or Nothing radio show, um, like, there's thousands and thousands, 26,000 downloads last year, simply on that one podcast that I did. They're making all kinds of uh, money on that, uh, putting ad and gaining ad revenue on my podcasts, and there's supposed to be, like, a payback thing. Good morning. <laughs> There's supposed to be a payback thing where uh, they we actually make money on the content of our podcasts, but for some reason I can't get them to let me do that. So I don't know how it's going to be in the future, but apparently Blog Talk Radio has cut off uh, anybody who has more than 30 hours of content on their platform. And so I don't know if I'm going to be able to do any more uh, podcasts for the time being. So I guess what I'll have to do is videos. And I'd rather do podcasts than videos because when I'm driving at night, you know, like last night, I pulled over and I took a 45-minute break, uh, which I'm required to take a 30-minute continuous break minimum uh, once within an eight hour period and so you know I want to do the radio show and I eat when I'm driving anyway so it's not like I need to stop to, to you know eat a lunch uh, so that's what I did last night you know I, I read and I thought the program was pretty good but um, when I can afford it I guess I will have to upgrade the content uh, of course like I said like I should be collecting ad revenues from the ads that they're putting on my podcasts which would pay for the program so I wouldn't have to you know I mean like I've got 461 episodes on my other Kingdom of God or Nothing podcast and I think I had 26,000 downloads last year I'm pretty sure they can afford to you know allow me to take uh, you know to pay me $39 a month so that I can, uh, you know, just have a, a regular basic program, but uh, whatever, I don't know, I guess I'll have to figure it out. Anyway, I was going to do a, a podcast on the Kingdom of God or Nothing, which anybody can find on iTunes. Uh, iTunes, just search the Kingdom of God or Nothing and you'll see a picture of Jesus and uh, sometimes you'll see a picture of me, but, um, you know, it's a pretty, like, you know, two to three hours per episode, and I thought the last one was good, and it kind of cut off, because we were moving, but I don't know what happened, but for some reason, I couldn't get back on, and I lost my password, and I couldn't get back in that way, and it was just a mess, so, anyway, um, I want to talk about... Uh, the the night I'm reading basically 95 Thesis by Ogden Kraut, uh, which is a book that is like my mon or my like my seven headed hydra like it's it's something that I I like to share. It's got a lot of good points, but it's really hard for me to get through it. Um, I did post a lot of the content. For people to read and to watch on my YouTube videos where uh, the 
the reader is reading it, you know, but like I said, I, I do that when I want to share something, but it seems like nobody wants to see that sort of stuff because I think, like, I might have seven views or something, you know, or one or two views per video, and I know it's an, it's just an easy way to make videos, and I, you know, I'm, personally, I'm more concerned about the content than hearing me read, but it is a computer voice, so, anyway, um, so I guess if I want to make these podcasts or videos, I'm just going to have to do it this way from now on until I can figure something else out. Anyway, we're on page 100 of 95 Thesis, which anybody can read for free online at ogdenkraut.com. Uh, I also have a lot of it posted up on Zion's Redemption Bookstore uh, on Facebook. It's a Facebook page, not a group. Just type in Zion's Redemption Bookstore and you'll find it pretty easy. And uh, like I said, I've, I, put the, I put the content for people to read it. And then I've also put a video, or like the the book reader video, and you can listen to it while you're doing other things, which is what I like to do. I mean, every night when I'm driving a truck, I'm listening to debates and like theological stuff and sermons and like rabbis. You know, I I I enjoy even though I don't agree. <laughs> Um, with Jews for Judaism, but they bring up a lot of really good points, and I learn a lot from them. Um, I also enjoy Fair Mormon, uh, which is a Mormon uh, podcast, and they also have videos and conferences and all of that. Uh, I enjoy Jake Hilton and the sort of Jehovah Ministries, even though I don't agree with them 100% either. In fact, um, I, I could probably argue with Jake, but I just, I'm tired of arguing with people, so, um, anyway, but, you know, I, I have a lot of things that I like to listen to, really like Ben Shapiro, and Andrew Clavin and Michael Knowles, and all of those guys, you know, at the Daily Wire, and I watch a lot of those videos, or not watch, but I listen to them through the stereo, and, um, you know, so I'm always learning stuff, but I also like to share. And, like, part of the reason why I like to do these things, like, I don't agree with Ogden Crowd 100% either. I think that he compiled a lot of really good stuff. I don't believe Brigham was the Lord's anointed. I don't believe he was second in line. I believe the church was rejected, as section 124 says, like I said, like I've talked about so many times before. I mean, I'm not going to get into it, but but I think that that Brigham tried the best he could as a as a Gentile to teach the people what Joseph Smith taught them. And uh and I enjoy reading the early leaders of the LDS church, even though I believe that the church was rejected in 1844 when Joseph Smith died. I don't accept any secession um, because the one that was supposed to secede was Hiram, but then also Jesus said, I will reject you if you don't do what I say, and they didn't do what he said, so what am I supposed to think, you know? I mean, I know that there's a lot of truth that comes through the different branches of Mormonism, and I appreciate that, but there's also a lot of speculation and false doctrine, and stuff that even contradicts what Joseph Smith taught, you know, so, anyway, but, um, this, con this particular compilation, 95 Thesis, basically goes on the premise that, like, Martin Luther, when he nailed 95, th his 95 Thesis to the, to the chapel door in Wittenberg, Germany, uh, about 95 different changes in the, in the Catholic Church from that of the Bible. Like, this is kind of like that. Like, this is not, this is um, Ogden compiling all these things. And it's kind of funny because um, I can't remember. I think Kevin Kraut was telling me that Ogden actually wrote this book in the period of about 24 to 48 hours. Like, pretty quick. Because he had all these, you know, compiled and everything, and he like just he he was uh, heading down Highway 89, and he decided he just got it in him that he needed to write this book and put it together, and so he like stopped and got a motel room in this small town. I think it was Fairview or Pleasant, 
Mount Pleasant. I I can't remember. It's been a while since I talked to uh, to, to uh, Kevin about this. Kevin's the son of Ogden Kraut. Uh, Ogden died a number of years ago, but anyway. But this particular book, I mean, he just like threw it out there. It was like he, all the study that he had done, and like one thing that I really like about uh, one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is when you study. Heavenly Father brings it to your mind, and it's so cool. Like, when I was in my early 20s, I used to go around the country as a truck driver, and just, I would witness to people, you know, I was like an uber Mormon missionary guy at that time, and, like, I'd go into, like, churches and stuff and talk to the pastors, and because I really liked the challenge, you know, and, and it was funny, like, I was... Um, talking to two pastors up in Washington one time and like we talked for like three days straight like we stopped for meals and like and late at night we'd you know I'd go back to my sleeper in my truck because I didn't have a load and I was waiting for this load and uh, well anyway so like they'd come in the morning and we'd go have breakfast and we'd talk all day long and it was just these two pastors and it was really cool because like both of them converted and they both were like I've never met somebody your age that knows the scripture so well and it was just because like I was driving around in my I mean I've been driving a semi truck for over 20 years now like if you consider the local stuff that I did before my mission I started in 94 driving a potato truck and the uh, a harvest truck up in Idaho and then um, I would I think I was 16 or 17, I can't remember. And then I got my CDL when I was 18 and, and got a local job, uh, you know, delivering produce and whatnot. And then I went on my mission. And then when I came home, I went over the road for three, or three and a half years from 98, I think, to 2003. And then after that, I was a belly, du uh, belly dump driver coal hauler you know and then I went and worked in the oil fields for a couple of years and I mean I've just I've been all over the place driving truck and I love driving truck because it gives me the opportunity to listen to scriptures and listen to you know podcasts and sermons and like back before we had like iTunes and all of the YouTube stuff like I used to spend of course I was single making 40 plus thousand a year um, and then when I worked in the oil fields, I was making like a hundred thousand dollars a year. And so, you know, I used to spend a lot of money on, uh, you know, Deseret book and tape, Siegel book and tape, the church distribution center, just listening to anything that I could get my hands on just to learn, uh, and like lectures and stuff and just, you know, anything. And I love learning I tried going to college once, though. I didn't like learning there because they told me what I had to learn, and I didn't want to learn what they told me I had to learn. I was more interested in history, uh, history of Christianity and Judaism, the history of world religions, and, you know, Mormon Mormonism, Mormon doctrine sort of stuff, you know, and the scriptures. So, anyway... <sighs> I'm going to start reading this because I'll just talk and talk and talk. So, I guess this is an extension of the Kingdom of God or Nothing radio show. Uh, and it might also just have to be the extension of Fundamentally Mormon because I haven't checked to see if they're going to cut me off there. But I know I have more than 30 hours of content on Fundamentally Mormon. So... And this is apparently something that they decided to come out with today with no warning. Uh, you know, they want to get that $39 a month plus the ad revenue. Whatever. I, I can't blame them. It's a business, but whatever. Anyway, um, so we're on page 100, and this is topic 70B. Laws of God over the laws of man. Proverbs 24, 8. Uh, I'm sorry, 28.4. They that forsake the law praise the wicked, but such as keep the law contend with them. And like in Hebrew, it doesn't say law. The one thing that drives me nuts about Christian translations of the Tanakh or the Old Testament 
is they like make up all this stuff. Like they, they replace words all over the place. Like even in Psalms where most of it is written in um, uh, Hebrew in Psalms 2 and then later Aramaic. Like they'll just switch, you know, like in Psalms 2 where it says, uh, uh, you know, talks about the sun. It doesn't say sun. It, it, I can't remember what it says, but like the translation, the translators, they like to like play fast and loose with the actual translations. And they used an Aramaic word where everything else was Hebrew. And then like they pop in this Aramaic word and say, well, this is what this. And it drives me nuts because like, uh, like the Strong's Concordance, they didn't go back and find out what the original Hebrew words were. They simply looked at the English translation or the English t translation and then they figured out what the Hebrew word was and then they said well this word means this but a lot of times they actually change the words so you're not getting the correct translation and the concordance it, it's so deceptive because they're like you know everybody runs to the Strong's concordance and says well this word means this and th but that's not what the original said you know, and like in the original King David, he said, they that forsake the Torah praise the wicked, but such as keep the Torah contend with them. So anyway, can't even get one scripture into it without going off the deep end on commenting, right? Anyway. Um, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. Acts chapter 5 verse 29. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servant ye are to whom ye obey? So if you're obeying God and his law, Jehovah and his law, then you're his servant, right? You're his doulos, his bond servant, his his child, his bride. Um, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Romans chapter 6, verse 16. So, you know, Yeshua, who the Gentiles call Jesus, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He actually said, if you love me, keep my Torah, my law. My, that, those were the commandments of God. And I know a lot of people say that, you know, the Torah was nailed to the cross, but it wasn't. The sacrifices were fulfilled for the atonement. But God's law remains. And, and I am un, under the firm belief that Moshe at, on Mount Sinai received a restoration of Torah, which was had at the beginning, because you see evidence of the true Torah all throughout the early, you know, the earlier, like in um, Bereshit or Genesis, you know. Um, they had laws, but we don't have, like, you know, the, the list. Of course, there's some other things, too, that uh, are hard to understand. Um, according to the book of Lehi, which I have, uh, which I don't like to share because it's like it's hard for people to really understand it. It's a very difficult book. Of course, there is a storyline there, but part of part of what is in there is that Lehi and Jeremiah and um, these you know these prophets before the Babylonian captivity they had a problem with what uh, what had had been changed in the land because when Josiah found the Torah scrolls in the temple, um, he formed a committee, and they added many things to Torah, to the 613 laws that we now have. That w A lot of that was added. Plus the Mishnah and the Talmud and what they did with that, the oral law and whatnot. Like, you know, even in Devarim or Deuteronomy, it says not to add to or take away from the, uh, from the law, you know, from the Torah. But they didn't care. And they added many, many things that were just not part of Torah. And, you know, Yeshua, Jesus, he 
lived Torah perfectly. He kept it perfectly. Part of the 613 laws is if you catch somebody in adultery, you have to stone them. That's in Torah. But Yeshua said, you know, let he who is out without sin cast the first stone. He should have been the one casting the first stone because he was without sin. If he wanted to keep the Torah, then he should have done that. But he wasn't part of the original Torah that Yehovah gave to Moshe on Mount Sinai. And, and there's other things, too, in the Torah that are just ridiculous, like uh, linen and wool. You're not allowed to wear a garment that has linen and wool on it. So, like, a lot of Jews will, like, look at their suits, and if there's a linen lining in a, in a wool suit, they're not allowed to, to wear it because it's breaking the mitzvot, or the Torah, or the commandments. Like, you have to kill a rebellious child must be brought before the council and stoned to death. A rebellious child. So like a lot of us out there, like myself, I was rebellious. I grew out of it. But that was part of, of the 613 laws that supposedly were received by Moshe on Mount Sinai. And I submit to you that those were added by King Josiah and his council. And that's one of the reasons why Yehovah destroyed Jerusalem and kept, carried them all, or had them all either killed or carried into captivity. Another reason was because they were keeping the Shabbat on what we would consider Wednesday or Thursday. Because it didn't matter, you know. And like Jeremiah even said, if you will just keep my correct Sabbath, I will, I will, you know, I will turn my face from, from the destruction that I'm about to, you know, cause. But they wouldn't. And like people that are like, hey, uh, you know, it doesn't matter that we keep Sabbath on Sunday. Well, it mattered a whole lot to those people who were carried into captivity, you know, by King Nebuchadnezzar and his armies from Babylon. Jehovah told them and warned them but, uh, through his prophet, Yahu or Jeremiah, to keep the correct Shabbat or Sabbath. That was never changed. The early Christians, or followers of Yeshua HaMashiach, they kept the true Sabbath. They also got together at the end of the Sabbath day, which was sundown Saturday, and they would meet together. So they'd go to synagogue, they'd keep the, the Shabbat holy, you know, Kadosh, and they would uh, then they would meet on the Lord's Day, which starts at sundown on Saturday, and they would have their meetings. And, like, it's even written that some guy fell asleep and fell out of the rafters and died, and he had to be, or, like, well, brought back to life. You know, because they were, they were there all night long. And Peter and Paul and those guys, they could talk. You know, but, you know, there's a lot of things. Like, they kept the, the, the mitzvot. They kept the the uh, Moedim, the holy days of Yehovah. You know, Paul even, or Shaul, he went, he was like, I have to get back to, to uh, you know, to Jerusalem to keep the feast because it was important for them. They sacrificed, you know, I think Paul or Shaul, he, he sacrificed like seven lambs to, uh, to, to take the Nazarite vow, the vow of the Nazarene, you know they kept these things still, and like, but Christianity they they don't understand these things, and because the Catholic Church, Constantine, the Emperor of Rome, hijacked the the early Christian Church. It was, it was seriously hijacked, and a lot of the traditions that the Christian Church has today are part of the pagan holidays that Constantine inserted into Christianity. You know, uh, Constantine made it illegal in the Roman Empire to be idle on Shabbat. Because he was going to change the Sabbath without authority. He was not a prophet. He was a, uh, maybe a prophet of 
Hasatan, you know, but he was going to make sure that everybody uh, had their Sabbath on Sunday because it went along with their pagan deity, the sun god worship. You know, he was a sun god worshiper. <coughs> Therefore, I, the Lord, or I, Jehovah, justify you and your brethren of my church in befriending that law, which is the constitutional law of the land. And as pertaining to the law of man, whatsoever is more or less than this cometh of evil. Well, that's interesting. That's Doctrine and Covenants, section 98, verses 6 and 7. And Doctrine and Covenants, section 134, verse 4, it says, we believe that religion is instituted of Jehovah or God, and that men are amenable to Him and to Him only for the exercise of it, unless their religion, religious opinions prompt them to infringe upon the rights and liberties of others. But we do not believe that human law has the right to in, interfere in, per, in prescribing rules of worship to bind the consciousness of men or dictate forms of public or private devotion, that the civil magistrate should restrain crime but never control the conscience, should punishment and it should punish guilt but never suppress the freedom of the soul. End quote. So that wasn't a, uh, a revelation, even though it was canonized in section 134, but those were the opinions of the elders of the church, Joseph Smith and others of the apostles. Uh, and that was a church statement, basically. Continuing on, quoting Brigham Young in Journal of Discourses, volume 11, page 269. Quote, this is Brigham Young. Do you think that we shall ever be admitted as a state into the Union without denying the principle of polygamy? If we are not admitted until then, we shall never be admitted. But today, in the current time of the Church, you know, I'm talking past the 1890s, finally we honor, finally we are in honor bound to the government and people of the United States under the consideration we have fully received statehood to discontinue the practice of polygamy or plural marriage. The Latter-day Saints will not violate their plighted faith. Statement by Grand Ivans and, and, and Clark, Way of the Master, uh, by Peterson... Mark E. Peterson, that would be, uh, page 63. Uh, this other one, and it, I don't know what the abbreviation for C-O-N-T, but apparently C-O-N-T, uh, volume 13, page 197. When the manifesto was given, the church wrote, Washington, D.C., we have voluntarily put aside something that we have always believed a sacred principle to be in harmony with those of our faith, not of our faith. And it's kind of funny because like one of the, and it's not really funny, but um, one of the things about, you know, the scriptures, it says uh, in the New Testament, the Brett Hadashah, I can't remember exactly where, but it says, you know, he who is friends with the world is an enmity or an opposition with God. Like, God gives us the commandments, and we're, you know, and Peter, and I can't remember who was with Peter, but, you know, they were on the steps of the temple, and, like, they're like, who should we, we would, or, you know, we'd rather obey God than obey man. Well, yeah, because who gives us salvation, or who punishes us? Shouldn't we be obeying what God has asked us to do, and not be doing what the world is forcing us to do? That's one of the reasons why I can't stand um, Pioneer Day or the 4th of July, okay? I love the Constitution. I have read books about Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin and uh, George Washington and all the... I mean, I really got into, to, you know, American history. I mean, I get in these moods where I'm like, okay, I'm going to study everything I can about this topic. And, like, I go crazy and I read all kinds of books and I listen to all kinds of stuff, you know. I believe 
that the founding fathers were inspired of God and that they were basically prophets. And the Constitution is next to Scripture according to what I believe. It was what we needed to bring about a constitutional republic so that men could be free and escape tyranny. And I know it wasn't perfect. And, and the amendments of the Constitution were, in, uh, well, some of them were inspired, like, you know, doing away with slavery, like letting women vote, like those type of things. You know, I believe those were inspired. I love the Constitution, and I love the principles of the Constitution, but it, it breaks my heart to see what is going on in this nation right now. What has been going on in this nation since Andrew Jackson, really, you know, basically what's going on and what people don't understand is we won a war against Britannia, England. But they came in with their banks and they bought up our politicians and our businesses and got the Federal Reserve Banking, into, which isn't even part of the federal government. It's a complete sham. You know, in 1913, it enforced all these rules. We are in servitude to Britain. We have a standing president who was allowed to do certain things, but, you know, I, I can't remember who it was. It was a British monarch that said... You know, let me have their banks and control their money and I could care less, basically, who runs the country. We won. And they came in, the, the royal royalty of, of the Illuminati, basically, of Europe, and they took over and now that's why our taxes are so ridiculous and that's why it's just... You know, but... So... So I love I love the Fourth of July because I love the principles that this or the founding you know this country was founded on. But at the same time, it drives me a little bit nuts because we as a people left Nauvoo and we left independence. You know, we came uh, we left the United States of America and went to Mexico to get away from the this government that persecutes our people. And what happened? We left the United States. Utah was in, in existence. The Great Salt Lake was in Mexico territory. And what happened? The President of the United States sent an army, Johnston's army, across to put down the saints to take them over and to imprison the men and women, you know, and, and to, you know, just persecute us. And God gave us a little bit of mercy by sending a very strong blizzard in May in Wyoming, which caused the, you know, Johnston's army to be basically use up all their, all their supplies and uh, they were a ragtag band of men when they finally got to to Salt Lake. And it's kind of funny because they didn't have the will to fight by the time they got here. And Brigham was, a, he, you know, basically, you guys can go through town and park over there <laughs> outside of town. And, um, but they had no food. So they had to, you know, so what happened was Brigham basically... You know, gave them food and took their cannons and their ammunitions and their guns away from them. And that's how the Mormon battalion, uh, the Mormon military, militia, or whatever you want to call it, became an armed military. You know, and but, you know, eventually they were able to resupply and then they, they started, uh, you know, Fort Douglas. And they had a cannon trained on the Salt Lake Temple for for many years, they threw our our leaders in prison, our people in prison, and like God. Okay, so why was there a restoration? Because in these last days, something has to happen. 
It is called Zion's Redemption. It is the city of Enoch returning to the earth. Who's on the city of Enoch? Father Adam and all the holy prophets. They're resurrected. They live there. The city of Enoch. Joseph Smith talked about this. And when a people, according to the Joseph Smith translation of Genesis chapter 9, when a people live all that God has commanded, then Zion will be redeemed. And you shall look up and you'll see the city of Enoch and the church of the firstborn come down out of heaven. Now, what is so important about that? All things have to be set in order. Father Adam has to issue out the inheritances and set the house of God in order. And all those things have to happen with the people who will live all that God has commanded, which includes plural celestial marriage, only to those who have been given revelation to live it. Because I believe there's a lot of people that live it because of their own lusts. You know, I, I mean, I believe in it. I'm not going to live it until God commands me to live it. And he'll have to, like, share the person because I'm not looking. Neither Kim, Kim and I, both my wife and I, were, we would do it if God asked us to. We believe it's a true principle. In fact, I've been given a vision to show me why it's so important, which I talk about in some of my other videos. I won't talk about that here. But, you know, the law of adoption. The gathering of Israel to one place. That is a commandment. It was never rescinded. Never was. Even though Joseph F. Smith said, Oh, we can go to wherever we want now. And then everybody after him, all these false prophets, um, you know, they, they say, Oh, we don't need to worry about that now. You know, why not? It was never rescinded. They never received, thus saith the Lord, revelations to do away with those things. And in fact, they don't even live what's in the Doctrine and Covenants. You know, United Orders is a thing. You know, and we do have to live the law of consecration with the United Orders in order to redeem Zion. And and even in the scriptures it says, and in Doctrine and Covenants, it is not given for one man to own that which is above another, wherefore the whole world lieth in sin. But you've got these guys who are making stipends of six-figure salaries every year and putting billions of dollars into the stock market of tithing money. Oh, they're investing it. Joseph Smith said, you shall not lay up one dollar for building up Babylon. But the church does it all the time because they are businessmen who have hijacked the church. You know, it is not given for one man to own that which is above another. It applies to everybody in the church. Living the law of consecration is something we all covenant to in the temple, but nobody lives it. And in the endowment, Jesus, uh, no, Lucifer is sent, and he says, all they who will not live up to the laws they've covenanted to this day will be under my power. Well, if you're not living what God, what you've covenanted with God in the Holy Temple, in the endowment to actually live, and and God puts Satan, a Satan there, and says, you know, you'll be in my power if you don't. Well, guess what? Maybe you're not exactly as pristine as you think you are. Maybe the reason why the church in Utah has such a problem with antidepressants is because the Spirit has left them. You know, they feel the Spirit sometimes because the Spirit testifies of truth no matter who says it. It doesn't mean you're a prophet just because the Spirit testifies of something you said. But I digress. You know, is that why Utah has such a horrible problem with depression and suicide and, and prescription pill popping? Because the Spirit has withdrawn from them and they're trying to, you know... Because they believe in false doctrine and they're not doing what God has asked them to do. And God has asked them to do it because Zion must be redeemed by a people who will live all that God has commanded. You know, so anyway, I got through one thing. I guess the next one that I'll do is uh, raising seed to a brother. But... I actually have to get up in seven and a half hours so I can get ready to go back to work tonight. And I will try to schedule a podcast for tonight. 
I did one at the end of uh, yesterday at 11. I think I started at like 11.45 <laughs> just so I could get it in there. But um, any videos that I make, any podcasts that I make, any, uh, any radio show that I create, uh, I will post them all at Zion's Redemption Bookstore on Facebook and also in LDS Last Day Prophecy Discussions and uh, LDS Gospel Mysteries. And let me just say real quick, I didn't used to believe Joseph Smith was a prophet. I was very anti. I was a Baptist. I, I, uh, I was baptized in the Mormon Church. When I was 16, I tried to remove my records from the church, and I was very anti. And, like, after that, I kind of went off the deep end with some things and I was really rebellious but God brought me down to my knees to the point where I was humble enough to actually listen to the missionaries and when they told me about Joseph Smith and his experiences with Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ I felt the Holy Spirit come down on me like fire and I heard angels singing and I know that sounds crazy but it was an, a very awesome undeniable experience the The Holy Spirit you know the, the, the peace and love and joy of the Holy Spirit just entered me and I was like wow I wasn't expecting it when I asked God if the Book of Mormon was true and when Joe, you know, I asked God if, if Joseph Smith was a true prophet, I cannot deny what I know. I know that uh, God has uh, made it so that you can like see it one way or see it another, and it's all based on faith. You know, there's so much evidence out there, but there's also a lot of lies. But I know that he was a prophet. I don't worship him. I'm thankful for his service. He died for the cause. You know, if he was lying, why would he die? But anyway, um, and I know that Jesus lives. I know he is my Lord and Savior. I absolutely love my Father in Heaven and Yeshua, or Jesus. And I have seen them face to face and embraced them in the flesh. I've, I've seen them many times in dreams and visions as, as well, which is something totally different. And people who are like, I'm a witness of Jesus Christ because they had a dream about him. Well, you know, dreams and visions, Joel, the prophet, said would come in the last days, and that's great. But I can tell you of a surety that I have seen them both face to face and embraced them in the flesh. And they are not spirits. Is the the false translation of the Bible says God is spirit we must worship him in, in spirit but you know Jesus is like handle me and see for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have and it's like delusional schizophrenia trying to like understand these things unless you understand these things right the Holy Spirit is a spirit and you must worship him in spirit and in truth Yeshua is a resurrected being. Handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone as ye see me have. And our Father in heaven, Yehovah, our Elohim, is also a flesh and bone being. And I know that that's just crazy, but guess what? Constantine hijacked the church. He changed things to fit his ideas of the way things should be. In Revelations it says, Jesus Christ, chapter 1, Jesus Christ, he hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. Jesus, after the resurrection, or actually, while he's hanging on the cross, he tells the thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Three days later, he says to Miriam, or Mary, as she's known by the Gentiles, touch me not, or hold me not. I have not yet ascended to my Father, but go unto my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father, and to your Father, and to my God, and to your God. 
How if Jesus is this trin trinity thing, you know? Oh, there's only one God, and, and his name is Jesus, and his name is Jehovah, and he's also the Holy Spirit, because there can only be one God, but they're obviously God. And, you know, John chapter 1 says the Word was with God, and the Word was God, but that just means that he was God, and, like, give it up. I'm sorry. I, I am totally against the Trinity, because I know the truth, because I've seen them face to face. You know? This, this false doctrine that has gone on Christianity has gone on long enough. And, and you cannot just continue to make excuses to go, you know, and, and there's no excuse for it, really. Because in James chapter 1, verse 5, it says, If you lack wisdom, ask God, and he will give it to you. God wants to give you revelation and confirmation of the Holy Spirit so that you can know the truth of all things. And to trust in, in the teachings of men without getting revelation from God brings a curse. And the curse is strong delusion according to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. All, they who uh, who, all those who believe the lie receive strong delusion that they might be damned because they did not love the truth. And why didn't they love the truth? This is my commentary now. Because they weren't willing to study it out for themselves and get revelation and confirmation of the Holy Spirit that what they believed was true. And if people would just do that, you wouldn't see 40,000 or 30,000 or whatever it is, Christian denominations all around the world, all teaching their own version of what Yeshua taught. Like he taught, you know, Ephesians chapter 4. There is one God that's talking about Yehovah He's our Father. One faith and one baptism. How many different kinds of baptisms do we have? They can't all be right. Yochanan the Immerser, actually, John the Baptist, he immersed in water. He had authority, too. He was the son of Zechariah the high priest. He had authority to baptize. You know, and, and Peter said, you know, they, they said, well, what should we do to be saved? And Peter said, repent, which means to turn back to God and live and, and do what he has asked us to do. Repent, turn away from your sins, and be baptized every one of you for a remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, I think. I, I get that one mixed. It's like in chapter 2 or chapter 3, whatever. But a lot of people are like, all you have to do is confess, and you'll be saved. But then Jesus is like, all they who come to me in, that, in the day of judgment, like that many will come to me in that day and say, Lord, Lord, have not we done many great works in thy name? And, and maybe they'll be like, I ran this church, and I preached, and I got all these people saved, because, you know, confession is the only thing that you've got to do. Well, what does Yeshua say? Okay, he doesn't say what it says in the Bible, in our current Bible. That Jesus knows everything. Okay, he knows everyone. He's God. He has the mind of God. But in that particular false translation, it says, I never knew you. Depart from me. No, that's not what it says. You never knew me. These people may know all about Yeshua. They may have studied their whole life in universities, deciphering, you know, this, that, and the other, but they never knew him by revelation. They never really got to know him. Because people, they put God in a box of their own understanding. And I asked God about that this one time, and like, he told me, you know, he wants to share so much with people, but they... They, they put him in a box and he can't tell them anything. Because they have their preconceived ideas about the way things should be. And it's really sad because a lot of people trust in, you know, sola scriptura, which drives me absolutely nuts, especially when you've studied the history of the Bible, you know, and, and all of the crazy things that have gone on, and knowing that in the earliest manuscripts, many things that, like... 
or purported to be said were they're not in there. They're just additions by the scribes and by the Catholics, basically. You've got to get revelation for yourself about the true interpretation of Scripture. Peter said, you know, the Scripture is not for private interpretation. Why did he say that? Because the interpretation belongs to Yehovah alone. And Yehovah will send the Holy Spirit to testify of truth to bring you to Yeshua, his Messiah, his only begotten Son, our Redeemer, so that we can come into back into his presence. And if we're studying and not going to him in prayer, asking for inspiration, revelation, and confirmation of the Holy Ghost that what we believe is true, you cannot climb through some other way to come into his presence. You've got to be able to get revelation for yourself. In Zion, nobody will have to say, do you know this, uh, the Lord, or whatever. Because we'll all know him. Because the people that are there are prophets. And Moshe, Moses, he said God would that all of his children were prophets. And this, his spirit would rest upon them. His ruach would rest upon them. We are the children of God. Literally made in his express image. And he wants to bring us into his presence. But we have to do what he has asked us to do. And Yeshua said it best. If you love me, keep my commandments. Anyway, like I said 10 minutes ago, I need to end this video so I can go to bed. But uh, next time I come back on, I'll try to remember. The next one is raising seed to a brother, which... It's pretty cool. Like it, it, this is Torah stuff, right? But and it actually shows the the actual commandment to live polygamy in certain cir circumstances. Anyway, um, you can also f well, I'm gonna post this on my YouTube page. You can find that by just searching, you know, Mark Lichten Walter. Just you know, you're looking at Facebook or whatever. You can see how to spell my name, or you can search. Uh, Messiah Ben Joseph or uh, facebook.com forward slash user forward slash God is my compass. Got a lot of videos there. Um, I also post a lot of stuff, like I said, in my different groups. My main group is uh, LDS Last Day Prophecy and Gospel Discussions. Um, by the way, anybody who does watch the videos there, if you want to block anybody, including me, like, I can still see what you post. You're not going to hide from me. Um, but I don't care if people block me. I, I like the discussions. And I allow all kinds of stuff to go in there as long as it's like LDS Mormon related. And I'm not talking about the mainstream Mormon Brighamite church in Salt Lake. If it's LDS, if it comes from one of the offshoots of the Nauvoo church, I'm allowing it in there. If it's if they're fundamentalists, I'm bringing it, you know... If, if like one of my friends, David Sundin, he's, he puts a lot of stuff and it's pretty, um, it's pretty offensive to mainstream Mormons. If you don't like it, block it. Who cares? You know, if you want to sharpen your sword of truth, then defend it with scripture, not with ad hominem and attacks and whatnot, but, and I don't allow that either in my groups, but. Um, you know, name calling and all that, but you know, I I put I post these things in that group and LDS uh, gospel mysteries and like if you want to comment, great, comment. Um, you have to be a member to comment. It's a public group, so anybody can see what is being said in the group. But you have to, you know, you have to join to comment. Um, and like I said, my, my Facebook page, uh, Church of the Living Messiah is one, uh, Messiah Ben Joseph is one, but the one that I really focus on is, is Zion's Redemption Bookstore on Facebook. That's a page I post everything on, I'll post this video there later, 
And uh, so anybody, you know, when you, you want to reach out to me or you want to comment on the videos, go ahead. I really enjoy reading the comments when I can get to them. Uh, anyway, um, I just thank you for watching this video, and I'm going to go to bed now. So, uh, and now I'll, I'll probably make another video tomorrow if I have time. Uh, Baruch Hashem, which means bless is uh, the name of God, Hashem. So Baruch Hashem Yehovah blesses our Father, Yehovah, and His Son, Yeshua. And I know, oh, I just opened up another can of worms. Before 1880, the church taught that Yehovah was the Father and Jesus was his son. In fact, one of Joseph Smith's prayers of dedication, he says it right in the dedication, and they changed it. The original said, but they changed it. Oh, we've got to change it because he was wrong. You know, let's change everything because the everlasting gospel is changeable, I guess. But in the, in the dedication, I think it was the Kirtland Temple, it, it actually says Jehovah our eternal Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And Ether chapter 3 actually teaches, and I don't want to get into it because I need to go to bed, but Ether chapter 3, Mohan Roy Moriankumar, the brother of Jared, actually sees Jesus, and Jesus is like, this is the first time I've ever showed myself to anybody, but guess what? Jehovah walked in the garden, he walked with Adam, he walked with Enoch face to face, you know, and Jesus in Ether chapter 3 is like, this is what my body will look like when I come in the flesh, but now I'm a spirit, right? But Jehovah actually had dinner as a resurrected being with Abraham and Sarah, you know, and wrestled with Jacob as a man, okay, because we're made in his image. But Yeshua, Jesus, didn't get his mortal body until the meridian of time. They're, the, they're two separate individuals. Joseph Smith taught it and they changed it afterwards because they have gone into apostasy and they've changed many things. And that's why we're reading 95 Theses, because guess what? Like, as you go through it, you're going to see, like, all the changes. So you can read that at ogdenkraut.com. I'm out of here. I need to go to bed. Love you all. Baruch Hashem. Shalom.